Hey guys, I'm editing this episode right now, but I forgot to put in a trigger warning. I show examples, videos of pets having seizures at the 240 mark. In between 240 and the 316 mark, there's videos of animals having seizures. So if you are triggered by that, fast forward through that part. What's going on guys? My name is Dr. James Cellini. I am a board certified practicing veterinary neurologist and neurosurgeon. Now lately in my channel, I've had a few videos that have been more of like the entertaining sort of variety where I just want to kind of have fun. Uh, but I don't want to lose sight of the fact that my channel does have, or at least I wanted to have, an educational component to it. So I'm gonna take this opportunity in this episode to talk about seizures in dogs and cats. We're gonna go through everything you need to know from what they look like, the causes, diagnostics you may wanna run, what your vet may talk to you about, medications for them, all that sort of stuff. It might be a little more dry, but again, I do wanna provide a little bit more educational content and kind of balance it out. But before I get started with that, if you don't mind, please hitting the like and subscribe button that helps with the algorithm as they say. Okay, now we can start. Discussing seizures and seizure disorders, the first thing you have to do is nail down your terminology a little bit. So I'm going to spend a very brief amount of time going through the relevant terminology that you'll need to know for seizures. Remember that a neuron is an excitable tissue, an excitable cell type that is constantly held in check. A seizure represents the uncontrolled synchronous discharge of these neurons in large groups in an area of the brain called the prosencephalon or the forebrain. It means the front of the brain. Seizures basically come in one of two forms, a focal seizure or a generalized or grand mal seizure. Generalized or grand mal seizure occurs when the entire brain undergoes this uncontrolled synchronous electrical activity. And it's the most common form that we see. The other form, a focal seizure, occurs when only one small group of the brain undergoes this synchronous electrical activity. And you don't see the kind of body-wide effects of it. It's a very focal presentation, usually in the head and face structures. The term epilepsy refers to recurrent seizures, whether they're generalized or focal. The telltale signs of a grand mal seizure include a loss of consciousness, convulsive activity, urination or defecation during an episode, and hypersalivation. Focal seizures can be very subtle and they usually involve a group of facial muscles twitching, drooling, sometimes the ears will twitch kind of very subtly, but there's not a loss of consciousness. There's not whole body convulsions, generally speaking. They're basically just kind of confined to one small group around the head and face. This is what a grand mal seizure looks like in a dog. This is what a grand mal seizure looks like in a cat. This is what a focal seizure looks like in a dog. This is what a focal seizure looks like in a cat. There are three categories of epilepsy, what we call reactive epilepsy, structural epilepsy, and idiopathic epilepsy. Most common causes of reactive epilepsy include metabolic disorders like a liver or kidney problem, low calcium, low blood sugar, stuff like that, as well as intoxication, stuff like organophosphates, strychnine, lead poisoning, antifreeze, all sorts of different things can cause dogs to have seizures. Structural epilepsy occurs when there is a structural brain lesion. So this includes stuff like tumors of the brain, strokes, meningitis, or congenital anatomical malformation. Idiopathic epilepsy refers to seizures of unknown cause, and this refers to situations where we've done a workup and we've excluded all possible causes of seizures through MRI, blood work, all sorts of things like that. Now, there are two major things that can clue you in as a potential classification of your dog's seizures before you do any diagnostic workup. The first is the age of onset of your pet's first seizure, and the second is whether or not your pet is normal in between the seizures. Dogs with idiopathic epilepsy typically have their first seizure between the ages of about six months to six years. The older your pet is beyond the age of six, when they have their first seizure, the less and less likely idiopathic epilepsy becomes and the more likely structural epilepsy becomes. The other factor to consider is whether or not your pet is normal or abnormal when they're not having a seizure. 
Animals with idiopathic epilepsy are completely normal when they are not having a seizure or have recovered from a seizure because there's nothing structurally wrong with their brain. They don't have a tumor or anything like that. So when they're not having a seizure, there's nothing affecting them. Now contrast that to structural epilepsy. If a dog has, for instance, a brain tumor causing their seizures, they're very likely to be abnormal in some way in between the seizures. So animals will do things like circle in one direction, stare into space, have behavior changes. Sorts of symptoms will clue you in to say there is a brain lesion, a structural brain problem that's causing these deficits, but also causing the seizures. The diagnostic workup for epilepsy of any cause is actually pretty straightforward. The first thing you always want to do is get a baseline blood work. Just make sure that the organ function is fine and there's no obvious cause of the reactive epilepsy that we mentioned earlier. The next diagnostic step after blood work, assuming blood work is totally normal and you've ruled out all causes of reactive epilepsy, really is the MRI. There's really no other in-between test to do besides that because at the end of the day, it comes down to obtaining an image of your pet's brain to see if there is a structural lesion there or not. So me personally, I recommend MRI in some patients a little bit more stringently than others. For instance, if a dog presents to me for multiple seizures and the dog is, let's say, three years old, is acting totally normal, my exam is totally normal, and especially if it's a breed that we know is prone to idiopathic epilepsy, like, say, a husky, I always offer it, but I don't generally push MRI because I'm so suspicious that the dog has idiopathic epilepsy and in this set of circumstances brains will look normal on an MRI and not really change the plan. On the other hand if I'm faced with a dog who's 10 years old and just had their first couple of seizures then I start to get a little bit more worried that we might be dealing with something like a brain tumor so in that pet I will a little bit more strongly push towards or at least recommend doing an MRI. I'm not going to get too in the weeds of treatment for specific conditions like brain tumors. That's a little too specific for this video. What I am going to talk about is the treatment of seizures themselves with what we call anti-convulsant medication or anti-epileptic drugs. Now, a very common point of confusion that I see both from non-neurologist veterinarians and pet owners is when exactly are you supposed to start seizure medication in pets? Now, the ACVIM released a consensus statement in 2016 regarding all aspects of treatment of epilepsy and in there they included criteria for when to treat and my clinical decision making is based purely on this consensus statement so you can look it up for yourself i'll post the link in the description but to summarize it you should treat a pet for seizures if they meet one of the following criteria number one if they have more than one seizure within a six month period you can have one but if you have more than one within six months that warrants starting treatment the reason we use that criteria is because human studies have shown that the more seizures that you have, the more seizures you are going to have, i.e. the brain kind of teaches itself to have a seizure. This is called a kindling phenomenon. So we try to prevent that and give a pet an opportunity to have one seizure, but after the first one, if they have a second one within six months, then we should really get on top of it and try to prevent more. The other criteria to start medication is if that one seizure lasts more than five minutes and a pet undergoes what is called status epilepticus. And this basically just means a prolonged seizure that is obviously very severe in its duration. If that happens, even if it's only one time, that warrants starting medication too. So there are multiple seizure medications, and I'm not gonna spend this video getting into the weeds of like how they work and the side effects and all that. But suffice it to say, the drug with the most evidence behind its use, and that is recommended by the ACVIM in their consensus statement from 2015, to use as a first-line drug in seizures for pets is phenobarbital. In my experience, this is the best drug to use because it's the most effective, both in what the research says and in my own clinical experience. And even though you can Google very scary things about this drug and find a myriad of anecdotes and side effects, which are real, they do happen from time to time, the vast majority of pets do very well on this medication in terms of side effects. So for the vast majority of pets, I tend to recommend phenobarbital as a first-line treatment. But like I said, there's many others. Medications like levetiracetam, zonisamide, potassium bromide, imipinolin. There's many, many medications. Talk to your vet about which is best for you and your pet to try first. There's no real wrong answer here necessarily. I just like, like I said, phenobarbital first because it has the most evidence behind its use. Now there is some research which I'll post in the description below regarding diet change, 
to help with epilepsy. I also made a video a few months back talking about CBD in dogs and its use in epilepsy and the trials that are ongoing right now. Finally, what are some of the expectations that you need to have as a pet owner going forward with an epileptic pet? Are they going to have a shortened lifespan? Are they gonna have a poor quality of life? What is their seizure control gonna be? Let's touch on that real quick. First and foremost, regarding expectations, the most important thing to know is that our goal is not to cure your pet of seizures. That's not really a realistic expectation. Our goal is to manage them. And we try to get the seizure frequency to about one every four to six weeks. We're not always able to do that, but if we can get to one every four to six weeks, most of the time pets will lead a good quality of life if they're that infrequent. Now the lifespan of a pet with epilepsy is dependent on what's causing the epilepsy. If we're dealing with things like a brain tumor, for instance, that's going to create a much shorter lifespan in general compared to a pet who has idiopathic epilepsy. I'm just gonna focus on the factors that affect the lifespan of dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. Now, a study in 2014 looked at the survival times of dogs with idiopathic epilepsy and found that many of these dogs live a pretty similar duration of life compared to dogs without idiopathic epilepsy. In my experience, what claims the lives of pets with idiopathic epilepsy the most is simply a combination of the emotional and financial toll that the condition takes on their respective caretakers. You can imagine the stress and having to take your pet into the emergency room in the middle of the night once a month and spending anywhere between 800 and 2000 plus dollars the whole time not knowing if your pet is going to make it back home. You can only do that so many times before you have to say, you know, enough is enough. And a lot of people reach their breaking point. As a final message to anybody who might be struggling with a pet with this condition, there is a little bit of a sense of guilt that pet caretakers can feel. I try not to take it personally. Um, sometimes this condition is just simply not readily treatable. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I know it was a little bit dry and a little bit on the educational side, but I wanted to get a video out there talking about epilepsy in a little more detail and kind of hit the highlights of it a little bit. So I hope you enjoyed this. Hope you found it useful. Feel free to leave a comment below if you'd like to talk about anything epilepsy related. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.